Okay, so um, uh, let's move on. Nahi, is that all right? Uh, yes, but it wasn't my question though. Someone else asked it. Oh, okay. I sorry. Yeah. Oh, barely alive. Is that okay? Okay. You don't have to out yourself. You can just be. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nahi is Captain Hook, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just my name. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. I I completely guessed wrong. That's good. The fact that I don't know who the quest who is asking the question yeah. is 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 precisely what this is about. The back channel is chat is about. Very good. Okay. So uh, I'm going to move on and give a brief overview of the of the landscape that we are using. What, what journey did we? How did we do this? You know, what was the story that we told? So we started this course with a review of classical thermodynamics. So by classical thermodynamics, we mean that you know, the thermodynamics which was developed before, say, the establishment of the atomic model. Uh, you know, I mean, it, the, the, the idea of atoms have been around for like almost 2000 years because, you know, Democritus, you know, proposed this idea many, many years ago. And, uh, and you know, um, even in the 19th century, the idea of atom was very, very uh, powerful. But because nobody had seen the atom, a lot of people refused to believe them, right? So a lot of the ideas of thermodynamics arose, you know, independently of the, uh, what the underlying, you know, uh, constituents of matter was. And, you know, these are encapsulated in the classical three laws, the, the zeroth law, you know, the, which is establishes that there is such a thing as temperature. And then the first law, you know, which has to do with the energy associated, internal energy associated with, uh, with systems and its relationship to say heat and work, like how, you know, heat and work change the internal energy. And then, you know, the second law, you know, which is, uh, you know, related to how entropy changes in a system in an isolated system, right? So these are the uh, classical laws of thermodynamics, you know, and after the establishment of quantum mechanics, which of course presupposes the idea of atoms, um, at least uh, in its modern form, atoms and particles, you know, we got the third law. And the third law just said that, you know, it's not possible to reach uh, T uh, equals to absolute zero, right? In finite number of steps. So this is essentially, you know, uh, the three laws, but along the way we introduce concepts. We introduce concepts such as, uh, um, you know, um, internal energy. We introduce concepts such as uh, entropy, you know, temperature, um, then, other kinds of energies such as, you know, free energy. And we've really only used these ones, right? And also like phi, we have um, used phi as well, uh, which is the, um, I forget the name. I think it's a grand uh, potential, but we have, may have introduced this later on. And then we have also introduced enthalpy, which we haven't really used. And, you know, and various things are, you know, and, you know, we, but what we did is that we just like all these things were just used to express the first law in various different forms, right? And all these, di all the expression of the first law in terms of these variables were related by Legendre transformation, which is a very nice transformation which allows us to change the, uh, the functional dependence uh, while keeping it a invertible two-way transformation. 
So in a nutshell, you know, that's really what our review of classical thermodynamics was. And after that, we went and we talked about what are the fundamental you know, concepts of statistical mechanics, right? So the fundamental concept, so here what we did is that we wanted to, you know, assume the existence, existence of atoms and, you know, microscopic, you know, constituents of matter. And from there, we wanted to derive all these different laws, or at least the first three laws. And there we found, you know, um, first what we did is that we use the concept of the microcanonical ensemble. Uh, but even before that, we actually, um, you know, the the uh, we uh, we had one assumption. We had one big assumption about statistical mechanics, and the assumption was that, you know, uh, you know, all accessible states. are equally likely. Okay, and we are, we are looking at, you know, uh, we are looking at um, systems in, in equilibrium mostly. And uh, so this is the fundamental concepts of, of fundamental assumption of statistical mechanics. And based on that, we first um, used uh, the assumption where the total energy was constant. And this was known as the micro canonical ensemble. And then we derived all the laws from the micro canonical ensemble. And we saw that essentially what it means is that the in the thermodynamic limit, which is the limit where n goes to infinity, the number of particles go to infinity, you know, the physically realized um, state of the system is this is the is a state which maximizes entropy. Okay, so if you saw that, and then you know we saw that okay, like this uh, microcanonical ensemble was not general enough for us because we wanted to consider you know, systems where even though the average energy was constant, the energy itself could fluctuate, you know, for, and, uh, and, you know, where the thing that was set was the outside temperature, T. And that led us to uh, consider the canonical ensemble. And for the canonical ensemble, we actually derived the law, the probability law for the canonical ensemble from the microcanonical ensemble by considering a small system that is uh, uh, thermally coupled uh, as well as you know physically coupled to a reservoir, and from there we discovered that you know the canonical ensemble, the relative probability of a of a system to be in state epsilon. Uh, energy E is given by E to the power minus beta E, where beta is 1 over KBT. This is the Boltzmann distribution or the Boltzmann factor. Okay, so, so that was basically the canonical ensemble. And then, you know, we wanted to consider the case where, you know, uh, we wanted to uh, consider where not only was the system exchanging heat with this environment, but it was also exchanging the number of particles. And therefore the, the number of total number of particles n was not you know constant. Okay, the average yeah, like just because, just as E could fluctuate, N could also fluctuate. And that led us to consider the Gram canonical ensemble. And there, you know, the probability distribution is, uh, you know, it's uh, 
generalized to beta mu uh, n minus e. Okay, so where mu is the chemical potential and its definition is that it is the amount of energy that you have to uh, you have to spend to add a single particle uh, to the system. But you know, but uh, subject to the condition that the entropy is constant, um, and <clears throat> so this is. So that was the grand canonical ensemble. So these that concluded, and then we, you know, uh, we discussed, you know, how some of this stuff were related to uh, the thermodynamics quantity via the partition function, and you know, the partition function gives us essentially the link between the microscopic and the macroscopic world, and most of the time. What we did is that we took the, the derivative of the partition function with respect to temperature and other things. And as a, as a result, you know, uh, most of the time, you know, um, if the partition function had something multiplying it, it didn't matter. But we saw that for the case of entropy, you know, uh, the partition, you know, uh, the number of particles uh, or that there was actually something, a subtlety, where I think for the entropy, it was, uh, it was we had to calculate something like this. And uh, because of this, you know, what mattered was the, 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 the log of Z that did matter. And that brought into play, you know, whether the particles that enter into these descriptions were identical or not. So identical particles or not identical particles did play a role in absolute value of entropy. And, you know, when we, when we discussed entropy in our classical thermodynamics, we always discussed delta S, the change in entropy. So we actually never discuss the absolute value of the entropy. So it's only when we go to statistical mechanics that the absolute value of the entropy becomes um, uh, obvious, it becomes important, and that allowed us to solve or resolve a paradox in classical thermodynamics known as Gibbs paradox. So the Gibbs paradox was solved by taking into account the fact that particles are not identical, sorry, identical particles are not distinguishable. You know, if you assume that, then Gibbs paradox is resolved. And that kind of points to the way towards quantum mechanics, right? Where in quantum mechanics, you know, this is built into this framework of the system. The whole Bose-Einstein statistic and the Fermi-Dirac statistics, as we saw later, we're built upon the assumption that, uh, you know, this was, um, that there are identical particles, uh, that, that uh, identical particles are indistinguishable. Okay. So that was like how we discussed the fundamental concepts of statistical mechanics. And from there, we moved on to uh, discussing classical gases. And in classical gases, you know, uh, we derive the equipartition theorem or theorems, I should say. So equipartition theorems, and we did that for say the ideal gas and then ideal monatomic gas. And we then also did for diatomic gases We found that you know the uh, the heat capacity uh, 
that was predicted uh, sorry what's the unit of heat capacity it's um, times the particle number yeah yeah exactly so uh, and that is going to be uh, you know this was actually a wrong prediction and this was the observed in the 19th century but it was only resolved through quantum mechanics and we had to take into account the translational vibrational as well as the rotational degrees of freedom to derive this and then we moved on from ideal gas to interacting gases and we discussed you know how we can model interacting gases by approximating them by say like a fluctuating uh electric dipole, and that led us to the van der Waal gas. The van der, the van der Waal, or yeah, and the, the van der Waal gas, we, you know, so we wrote down the equation of state for the van der Waal gas, as well as the ideal gas. And I think that is basically where uh, we ended with our classical statistical mechanics and then we moved on to a bit of detour to quantum mechanics where we I, I tried to give you some flavor of some of the fundamental ideas of quantum mechanics especially density matrices so density matrices you know which incorporate into quantum mechanics classical uh, you know uh, probabilities so after doing a bit of quantum mechanics, and which also included entanglement, um, as well as the block sphere, which is the quantum um, the Hilbert space for a qubit, we moved on to quantum gases. So for quantum gases, we first, uh, looked at an ideal Bose gas or ideal ga quantum gas, I should say. We didn't say Bose. Uh, so ideal quantum gas. And then, you know, um, we um, and after doing that, we moved on to, you know, discussing the Bose-Einstein statistics. Statistics and the Fermi-Dirac statistics. And the, what we did is that then we discussed the ideal Bose gas. We worked out its uh, state equa you know, equation of state implicitly and we worked out its high temperature limit Sorry. high t limit and we also looked at the low t limit and in the low t limit we dis we discovered that you know the the ground state plays an important role where you know below a temperature t equals to tc you know most of the particles most of the bosons you know go to uh, the you know go to the ground state uh, e0 and that is that state of matter is called a bose einstein condensate Okay. And so today I want to discuss a little bit more about the Bose-Einstein condensate. Okay. Do we have any questions from from this so far? Okay. Let me. Uh, my computer has gone dark. Okay. We have a few more questions. Okay. These are follow-up questions from uh, you know higher from the previous question. So I'll get back to that. 
in the meeting. Sir, I asked a question in Google Meet chat. Okay, ah, okay. So that is not on my screen. Yes, uh, but let me go there. Okay, uh, what does it mean to have a symmetric wave function and an asymmetric wave function? So I probably kind of, okay, yeah. So Nian has already answered that. And Yan is saying that a symmetric wave function is one where the two uh, arguments, if you, if you, uh, you know, if you uh, swap them around, gives you the same function. Where the symmetric wave function is something where, you know, you pick up a minus sign. So remember that we gave an example when we were talking qubits. For the qubits, you know, we can say this is a wave function where, say. This is zero, this is one, this is one, this is zero. This is a this is a particle one, particle two, this is particle one, particle two, and I'm just throwing in factor one over square root of two for normalization. So then you know um, if I so okay, let me not use one here. Uh, so if I now um, so my question was about the physical interpretation of the symmetric or asymmetric. I got the mathematical part, but can right, the, yeah, to the real life. So the symmetric, so there's a lot of physics there. Uh, you know, the main thing is that when you're symmetric, you know that they're going to be bosons and they're and the symmetric, they're fermions. But apart from that, you know, just look at, you know, uh, you know, if you have, say, um, you know, a symmetric wave function, and you, uh, you take, say, x1 equal to x2 equals to 0, what do you get? You just get the identity that psi is equal to psi. So there's no problem for bosons, which are described by symmetric wave functions, to be on top of each other. OK? So, you know, so that's something completely natural. And in fact, that's essentially that is what happens when you're looking at the Bose-Einstein condensation. Is that, you know, so you know, particles are described by their quantum numbers. What are quantum numbers? Quantum numbers are numbers or eigenvalues of, you know, observables that describe the state. So for a particle which doesn't have any charge the quantum numbers would be, you know, its position, if you can measure it, its momentum, you know, the, its momentum, sorry. Um, and, you know, we can't really measure these two things simultaneously. So we can just take one of them. And then, you know, if it has spin, if it is fermion like that, if it says boson, it's just say one or two. And then, you know, if it has charge, it's charge, but we are, for simplicity, let's not take charged particles. So these are quantum numbers. Okay, so, so when two particles have the same quantum number, you know, bosons can have the same quantum number. And that's what we mean here. Like their positions are the same. But for fermions, you know, this is not true. You know, what is true is that psi x1, x2 is equal to minus psi x2, x1. Now, if I take x1 equals to x2 equals to 0, well, I mean, this is just 0 for convenience. It could have been any number. Uh, then, uh, so yeah, we don't have to do that. Then what do we get? Psi is minus psi. And the only solution to that is psi must be 0, right? So that means that for fermions, two part, you know, so that means that the particles have disappeared. So, the, so this means that particles, which are fermions, cannot have the same quantum number. Okay, it means that they cannot be at the same place at the same time. Yes, sir, understood. Okay, all right, good. Okay, so any more questions? Uh, Okay, let me get back to the uh, the other questions, uh, which is, 
why, what about more than three dimensional spatial dimensions? Is there any case like anions in higher dimension? For particles, the answer is no. And the, the interesting thing is that it, it has a topological, there's a topological reason. The idea is that if you are in two dimensions and there's a particle here, if you have another particle, you know, which goes around this particle, like if you take it and then, you know, then the path of this, of particle number two, you know, it's, it cannot, you cannot shrink this path without crossing one, particle one, right? But if you're in higher dimensions, so you, this is your particle number one, and you know your particle two is this is the path. Then you can shrink this path without crossing particle one, right? And it's really this this topology that is very special to two dimensions, which result in uh, this anionic statistics in lower dimensions. This is related to an idea in differential geometry known as holonomy, okay? So in high dimensions, you know, this, the fact that, you know, you can then, uh, you know, take this, you can, you can um, shrink this path to a point is, is, you know, works in any dimension D greater or equal to three. And therefore, in dimension higher than three, there are no anions. Okay. However, if you, you know, if you think of the statistics of strings, then strings in D equals to three are going to have similar infinite strings. They're going to have similar, uh, you know, properties as anions. Okay. And but that has a physical interpretation, not in terms of spin, but in terms of windings.